Right, good morning. So I'm going to take you back to the 60s. Um, this is kind of one view of the 60s. It's, uh, we're going to see this font, uh, this typeface again. Um, it's uh, Gil Sons. This is relevant to something, trust me. Um, but, but 1968, when people often think about it, it's kind of like a little bit more like that. So how are we going to get there? It's currently 2018. Turns out I have a time machine. Um, uh, but I'm actually going to take a, uh, I'm going to take a shortcut. Um, we're going to actually use the power of Facebook. Um, there we go. It turns out Facebook can take you back to 69. We'll just walk the distance from there. Okay, it's uh, it's only a short walk. Uh, which is, uh, Facebook aren't sponsors. Good. <sighs> I mean, these days they're just messing with our society. There, we're messing with the fabric of space and time. Thanks for taking the time to make a report. Uh, apparently, my feedback was used to help feedback uh, improve Facebook. I've not noticed it, but there we go. Um, <laughs> So, okay, what, what was happening in 68? What was, what was happening? And there, there, there's reasons I'm talking about. It's not just because it's 50 years. Um, Jimi Hendrix Experience had one of their best years. Uh, it was just like their peak year. Uh, two albums uh, peaked in the charts that year. Uh, Led Zepp were formed. Yeah, I can actually stop the talk here. This is a really good year. Um, sadly, also, we were at the uh, uh, kind of... Uh, the Cold War and the threat of uh, nuclear annihilation, which has come back into fashion, actually. It's quite nice to be able to share something with your kids like that. Um, you, know, you know, hey, sons, let, let me just share the kind of like the whole fear of nuclear Armageddon, what it was like growing up. You know, just, you know, it's just like, oh, thanks, Dad. Um, uh, it was time to change. So we had Prague Spring, um, Paris riots, uh, civil rights movement in the States, the uh, Fair Housing Act. Um, Sadly, we also, uh, very significant event, Martin Luther King was shot. But there was some also some very interesting stuff, some other good stuff. We started getting a better world view of ourselves. Uh, coming up, just coming up next month, 24th of December, is the anniversary of the Earthrise shot, which is a classic um, piece of uh, 20th century um, uh, sort of imagery. Um, and this was the first time Humans have been out to deep space. This is the Apollo 8 mission. And we're going to come back to Apollo. It turns out it's quite important for a number of reasons. Uh, the Apollo 8 mission did a, the first uh, circumlunar flight, and they took this shot, which kind of uh, helps you realize um, that uh, we're, we're not quite as big as we think we are. Um, meanwhile, back on Earth, actually, I say meanwhile, actually, I was already, I, I, I wasn't a child of 68. Uh, I just snuck in. That's me, the little guy there. There you go. So I was non-null at the beginning of 1968, um, uh, which is kind of interesting because that actually means, based on the Facebook bug, which is a, uh, an epoch bug, the uh, uh, 1st of January 1970, it actually means that I was born before the beginning of time. And based on the bug that's, uh, that's the 32-bit uh, signed wraparound of time T, with any luck, I will be alive after the end of time, which kind of logically speaking makes me immortal, which is just, you know, it's not a bad, not, not bad for a uh, Thursday, really. Um, also on TV at this time, Star Trek. And I am definitely of the generation and genre disposition that I struggle to not smile when somebody talks about enterprise software. Or enterprise frameworks. I'm sitting there going, oh, enterprise frameworks. OK, so what are you going to do? You're going to have the hangar at the back. You've got your nacelles. Kind of what warp factor are we looking for here? And it's always something disappointing. Oh, you did it in JavaScript. Oh. Um, so um, also one of my favorite films of all time. Um, I said the font was relevant. That's uh, Gil Sons making a feature there. 1968, before. Uh, we actually landed on the moon. There was a, a wonderful image of uh, moon landing there. Um, just for the typographically inclined, uh, one of the on, uh, interesting features is that the zeros in 2001 are actually O's. That's one of the things that gives it its distinctive uh, visualization. I quite like typefaces. I think they're quite interesting, um, such as this one. Um, this, is, uh, this was supposed to be Gilson's, but in the PDF version, it's Futura. They're about a year apart, 1927, 1928. Um, and software engineering, this is the classic NATO-sponsored conference in Garmisch, 1968. Now, if you're looking for the 1968 Australia connection, which I've been strangely quiet about, I can offer it to you now. 
the day after the conference, 12th of October, Hugh Jackman was born. There you go. Um, <laughs> don't say I don't spoil you. Uh, but this was, a, a, this was an era and subject-defining conference. Many people refer back to the Software Engineering Conference uh, in 1968. Some people to blame it, some people to praise it. Everybody refers back to it, but surprisingly few people actually read the proceedings. But thanks to the web, you can do that. So I did. Um, so as an example, we can kind of see this. This is kind of sometimes seen as the kind of touchstone um, moment in uh, the software craftsmanship movement. But I remember reading this book um, by Pete McBreen. There's some good stuff in it, but I remember struggling with some of the stuff because I sort of felt some of the history was a little revisionist, um, starting with this one. Software engineering was invented to tackle the problems of really large NATO systems project. There's only one problem with that. It's false. Apart from that, it's absolutely fine. Um, the term software engineering actually nothing to do with NATO. Just because somebody sponsors something doesn't mean that they did it for that reason. Uh, I don't think the word NATO is mentioned anywhere in the proceedings except the front page. Um, and thank you for our sponsorship, and that, that's it. Um, the term is actually invented by Margaret Hamilton. I said there was a moon connection. Margaret Hamilton, um, she uh, led one of the teams uh, that developed the software for uh, Apollo. And indeed, it's her, uh, some of her code she was smart enough to put a bit of fault tolerance in that people really hadn't thought that you needed, except that cunningly enough, she took her daughter into work one day. And do you know the way that kids, they're much better than cats, much better than cats um, when it comes to really trying things out and putting systems into illegal states. So ultimately, she had this really smart algorithm that, uh, for the time, basically ditch load at a particular point. Ditch load at a particular point so primary tasks could continue. This is great stuff. This is a time-triggered embedded system. Um, this was a really uh, a great insight. And in fact, it, it dealt with one of the alarms um, uh, that actually is it's quite famous. It was quite good to see the film uh, First Man recently. It actually, there's a, that moment is actually featured in the landing sequence. Uh, Margaret Hamilton um, made the search. See, I, I began to use the term software engineering. So she, we originate, uh, she's the, the origin of this, to distinguish it from hardware and other kinds of engineering, yet treat each type of engineering as part of the overall systems engineering process. Her view was very much she was trying to put software engineering into the frame because we're definitely talking a period of time where this kind of software was not really seen to be a proper thing. It was kind of like an optional extra. You bought the hardware and software was just like sort of seasoning gently scattered over the top. Yeah, um, yeah I guess slightly buggy seasoning. Um, uh, in fact, the term, the term had been used and was in currency um, uh, long before 68. Uh, Anthony Ushinger uh, was president of the um, ACM. And in 1966, he wrote this. Uh, we must recognize ourselves, not necessarily all of us, and not necessarily uh, um, every, any one of us all the time, as members of an engineering profession, be it hardware engineering or software engineering. So the term is relatively well established. We'll be coming back to that, uh, those proceedings, because 1968, filled with other things. Uh, conference proceedings, oh, filled with conference proceedings. 1968, the Fall Joint Computer Conference. Um, mostly quite dull titles, computer, uh, data structures for computer graphics, uh, hybrid systems for partial differential equations, um, you know, plain talk, machines that speak your language. Yeah, still working on it. Um, planning models for management. Interesting, it's a simulation-driven approach. A research center for augmented human intellect. Ooh, that looks interesting. That's a rather curious title. Doug Engelbart. This was the mother of all demos. This was networking. This was uh, collaborative editing. This was dynamic loading. This was hypertext. This was the mouse. This was all of these things. So basically, the way that you work now was invented in 1968. And sometimes people tell me, oh, no, but the stuff we do now is so much better, our IDEs and all the rest of it. I have some really bad news for you, and you will appreciate it perhaps better at the end of this talk. Um, there, have been a few, there have been new ideas since 1968. Honestly, but most of the things that can be credited for your daily work experience are actually to do with one, money, and two, hardware. Not software. The software has not improved. The hardware has improved, allowing people to fulfill the dreams of the late 60s. That's kind of, well, we've done a little better than that, but not much better. So 
Let's go back to this. Let's, let's understand what people were saying. Now, I'm not going to say that everybody agreed with everything that was said. This was a conference. It had a number of diverse points of view. Um, but there's some interesting stuff in here. Sometimes people say, well, you know, software engineering, that's, that's all plan driven. That's all waterfall. That's all. OK, let's have a look. Let's see what they actually said. So J.W. Smith, I've, I've only been seven months with a manufacturer, and I'm still bemused by the way they attempt to build software. They begin with planning specification, go through functional specifications, implementation specifications, et cetera, et cetera. And this activity is represented by a PERT chart with many nodes. If you look down the PERT chart, you discover that all the nodes on it up until the last one produced nothing but paper. Honestly, this could have been written at pretty much any time in the 20th century, and you can replace PERT with your favorite chart of choice. My favorite quote, it is unfortunately true that in my organization, people confuse the menu with a meal. Feel free to use that one. That, that, quote, that quote would happily sit in any blog these days. Um, but he was not alone. Douglas Ross, the most deadly thing in software is the concept which almost universally seems to be followed. I want to sort of inject a, an observation here about the tone of this document. This is 1968. The, as far as they were concerned, software development was an old profession. Hell, they've been doing it since the 50s. There have been people doing it since the 50s. Just like, look, we've seen all of this. We keep doing the same. Let's move on. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's see if we can do that then. You are going to specify what you are going to do and then do it. And that is where most of our troubles come from. Again, a quote that you could take quite happily out of context and place it in many organizations today. The design process is an iterative one, Andy Kinsler. Something happened after 1968. Some people blame flares, some people blame disco. I'm easy on this. But clearly, we were not making the best of the intellectual, um, I don't know, output of this uh, conference. But the word iterative is not the only one that occurs a number of times. Going through the document, I was surprised to discover that unit test, the phrase I had dated, the phrase prior to reading this, I had dated the term unit test back to the 1970s. Oh, no, they were quite happily using it in the 1960s, it turns out. Middleware, I definitely did not have that before 1980. Uh, I was wrong. Modularity. Well, some people think modularity was the 1970s things. No, no, no. An approach to modularity that was popularized in terms of information hiding and Parnas, people always refer to his 1972 paper, but modularity, no, that was definitely not new as a term. Um, declarative, acceptance testing, layers. Conway, as in Conway's law. We're going we're to visit Conway. Christopher Alexander. Yeah, Christopher Alexander. <sighs> He was, at this point, famous for writing this book, which is one of those books that you definitely get the sense that the title worked better on paper than it did in spoken word. Notes on the synthesis of form. It doesn't quite work, yeah? Which is why people always refer to it as notes or synthesis of form. But you never say the whole title because it gets a little difficult. And there's a glo this is my copy of it, and I just, you know, you've got to, there's a real feel of the 60s there. You know, people don't produce books like that. They don't use typefaces like that. Um, Christopher Alexander is perhaps later famous for being the guy who came up with patterns. That's 1970s. So it wasn't all flares and disco. Um, so patterns, I'm very influenced by. Um, that made its way into software development via Kent Beck, um, uh, who read Christopher Alexander's work. Now, the reason I'm refer taking a brief side journey here is very much the observation from Brian Foote in the patterns community. Patterns are an aggressive disregard of originality. Because this encapsulates perfectly, one, why we need to have a better sense of history, and two, what we mean when we talk about um, an engineering profession, as opposed to many of the other. There are many different ways that we can cast and slice software. Um, and Glenn Vanderberg has this lovely quote. Capsule definition of engineering, independent of any discipline, as you'll like to find, the set of practices and techniques that have been determined to work reliably through experience. I quite like that. It's a very robust definition. So, Let's go back and look at other things that were said in the software engineering proceedings. Now, often people are concerned that the waterfall model, we've already established that that was not the outcome of this uh, document, um, but also 
they were very careful to head off false parallels with engineering and, and the misapplication of the metaphor. Again, it's really worth reading what people actually write rather than quoting them out of context. It turns out that this idea that the production phase is people typing is as stupid now as it was then, and it was also recognized back then. Peter now and Brian Randall, the editors of uh, this, put in, the replication of multiple copies of a software system is the phase of software manufacture which corresponds to the production phase in other areas of engineering. It turns out we have no logistics in software. It's great. Yeah? We just have all the other problems instead. We've taken out the logistics. It is accomplished by simple copying operations and constitutes only a minute fraction of the cost of software manufacture. That's it. We're done. So they actually preempted many of the criticisms that people then tried to level at this. Again, always worth knowing your history. So let's go back to Christopher Alexander and notes. It, it turns out that this was more influential than I gave, than I understood when I read this. Uh, I'm trying to think when I read this. I probably read this in the 90s or the early 2000s. And it was published in 64. It turns out that it was one of the kind of standard books that was doing the rounds in a number of different, uh, number of different circles, uh, academic circles, engineering circles. Um, it wasn't just about architecture. He was very much interested in how do we design? What are the systems of design? Um, and this is why he gets referenced, and this book gets referenced in a couple of places, uh, because people say, OK, how do we think about large systems? How do we think about development? Um, we may therefore picture the process of form making as the action of a series of subsystems, all interlinked yet sufficiently free of one another to adjust independently in a feasible amount of time. It works because the cycles of correction and recorrection which occur during adaptation are restricted to one subsystem at a time. Here he could be talking about teams, he could be talking about the modularity of software, he's talking about refactoring, he's talking about this idea that you do not know the answer up front. This is why it was referred to, it's this whole idea of how can large systems evolve and yet, not, um, uh, and yet have some kind of coordination between different people and code that gets old, and how do we do this? Well, we don't couple everything together. So it's this kind of systems thinking. Couple with diagrams, this, uh, this, yeah, this diagram, okay, here we have these subsystems and so on. This is kind of an interesting one. When you take this together with some of the ideas that he had um, on wholeness and having things being kind of alive, recognizing that things have a life and a life cycle, um, later on, this is uh, some really interesting observations that we are only now reclaiming. It turns out, though, people were really big on drawing diagrams with circles and lines in the 60s. Yeah, we, 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 rectangles came along in the 1990s and swept away the era of circles. But people were obsessed with circles and lines and subsystem drawings. This is one. There you go. Well, this one's from uh, the original paper by Melvin Conway, How Do Committees Invent? You see, I hadn't made the connection until I put together the first version of this talk, and I suddenly said, wait a minute, that's where we got the diagram form from. Everybody was doing this. You know, it's just like I've got a new methodology. Hey, draw some circles, okay? Link some lines. But that's where this, this is an inspiration. So it's only when putting this together. So this was published in 68, and it's referred to in a number of places um, in the uh, uh, software proceedings, uh, the software engineering proceedings. Uh, this is the bit that people normally quote. Uh, by the way, it is compulsory. If you're not aware of it, it is actually compulsory these days to mention Conway's Law at a conference <laughs> on software. Um, Conway's Law, I've noticed, has a roughly 10-year cycle. We included it in the uh, patent-oriented software architecture books about 10 years ago. Um, uh, uh, and it was having a bit of a heyday then, it was mild compared to what it is now, but you know, it still had presence, and late 90s was the time I noticed it before, so yeah, we were, it's about to go out of fashion, so you know, see you back here in kind of the late 2020s. Um, but people normally quote this bit. Uh, the basic thesis is that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. Very carefully worded. Um, Melvin Conway is still very much alive and still being very careful with his words. And he meant these. Um, uh, he meant communication structures. He didn't mean just organizational structure. He meant how do people actually communicate as opposed to how do you want them to communicate. Ignore the organogram. What are people actually doing? Um, and people then ignore the rest of the document. It's worth reading the rest. We have seen this fact has important implications for the management of system design. A design effort should be organized according to the need for communication. Now, this is quite interesting because there's this idea, it's not organized just on resource availability, terrible terminology that that is, 
Um, it's not just organized on who's around. It's not just organized on skills. It is organized on this as well. This actually creates a, an interesting balance um, of how do we communicate? What is the structure of the system? Or what kind of structure of system can we support with our communication? There's a nice feedback cycle here. Uh, and one of the nice things, uh, more recently, um, Your Code is a Crime Scene by Adam Tornhill. Strongly recommend this book uh, for, for a number of reasons. But one of the things that's interesting is that uh, Melvin Conway made his observations based on relatively small amounts of data. But these days, we have so much code that we can look at. And um, Adam talks about uh, Conway's law. We can actually go and see this in code bases. And there's a, there's a lot of good stuff here on uh, uh, code analytics. Um, even though Conway formulated his law around the initial design of a system, the law has important implications for legacy code as well. This is the important idea, is that one of the things we have learned since the 60s is, well, legacy. People did not use the word, I did not find the word legacy mentioned once in the NATO document. Okay, so yay, we invented something. That's really cool. Um, okay, so uh, here we go, legacy systems. Um, or uh, this is going to be the state of technology um, in the UK uh, after Brexit. Uh, <laughs> I think that's going to be our peak computing achievement. It's, uh, uh, it goes back about 4,000 years, um, like some members of the Conservative Party. Um, uh, perhaps we should ask them, because you know, we, we look at this, and I, I'm, when, in this shot, I managed to get the shot of the raven in as well. That's like perfect. That was not photoshopped in. Uh, and this was, uh, this was a romantic day. Um, it was uh, Valentine's Day. Uh, so my wife and I decided, hey, let's take the boys to uh, you know, Stonehenge. You know, forget all that restaurant nonsense. Let's go, and, let's go and look at some really big old stones. And the kids were there going, like, wow, Dad, that's huge. And they'd seen pictures and everything. So they hadn't appreciated how big those were. Why did they build it? I have no idea, son. It's a legacy system. We have no idea why they built it. We, we've, you know, you know we, we don't know why. We don't know how. We, why on earth would you take these stones from, well, I guess we're in New South Wales, old South Wales, across the water to, to it's just, why would you do this? You know, and I, I've had people on, online suggest, well, you know, it's a classic problem of no documentation. Documentation did not exist because writing did not exist. They had not yet encountered writing. So, you know, we got this. And we're not really not sure how it works, but twice a year it produces results. Okay, so we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna bank that. So why am I showing you this? Um, partly for a bit of fun, but also monolithos. Greek, one stone. One very, very big and difficult to move stone. And when we talk about, when we use these metaphors, it's kind of like, oh no, this is what we want our software architecture to be like. This was my youngest son when he was about five, it's quite a few years ago. He, he arranged this with uh, Pebbles of the Beach, even put in the nice little Japanese aesthetic with the seaweed on the top. And everyone says, this is my architecture, this is what we want. You know, we want beautiful, small, tightly arranged stones. And we can pull out Doug McElroy's quote. This is the Unix philosophy. Write programs that do one thing and do it well. Write programs to work together. And this is quite an old thing. This is quite an old thing. So a little, it postdates the 60s ever so slightly. And we'll come back to Doug McElroy. But there is one thing. Whenever, whenever I put this diagram up, everybody goes, oh, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about microservices. <laughs> My response is, if that, if that makes you happy, absolutely. You know? Yes, I am talking about microservices. I'm talking about any attempt at organizing a system around modularity at various degrees, either for development and or for deployment, any one of these efforts, again, that's something that comes in and out and has improved over time, again, thanks to <coughs> hardware. You couldn't have done microservices the way we do it now 20 years ago because of, well, hardware, yeah? These days, hardware is primarily what allows you to do that. Okay, it's sheer amount of computing power and network bandwidth you can throw at something and say, yeah, you know what, this is a viable architecture. In the late 90s, it would have been an absolute waste of processing power and network. Um, but disappointingly, many of the principles are not new. Or unsurprisingly by this point, 
E.E. E. David, this was an unexpected moment in the uh, reading this. Define a subset of the system which is small enough to bring to an operational state, then build on that subsystem. You see, the, the careful bit here is everybody has been talking about define small subsets of systems, but this is the first time I've seen the phrase operational state. He's not just talking about make it so it's a nice piece of code and elegant in its own right. It should actually work. The strategy requires the system to be designed in modules which can be realized, tested, and modified independently apart from conventions for intermodule communication. The idea is, given the technologies of the time, that there is a benefit to being able to do this. And this is not the modularity of Parnas, which is about information hiding. This is a modularity that is related to development and deployment. Very, very, and, and he uses that crazy word testing. We're going to come back to that crazy word testing in a bit. So microservices. Sadly, what we've discovered is that most microservice architecture, there you go, standard microservice architecture, um, doesn't end up as the pretty stones. Alan Perlis, who was the first recipient of the Turing Award in the 1960s, in the long run, every program becomes Rococo, then rubble. Now, he also observed, he was present at the 1968 meeting, a software system can best be designed if the testing is interlaced with the designing instead of being used after the design. So there's very careful wording, this idea of interlacing. Not a, we're going to have a design phase. This is definitely not the thing that people were saying. And even where I've said, even in the document, there is one diagram where one person is proposing an approach to testing. They make sure it's angled. The line is not angled. You don't finish the coding and then start the testing. It's angled. So actually, there's an overlap between, even when the phase model, they actually had overlap. So. One of the things I quite like is words. I quite like words. They, they're, they're kind of the vehicles of meaning. And I run a, um, I run a page on Facebook, um, so there you go, positive reference to Facebook, uh, called Word Friday, where I normally highlight an unusual word most Fridays, uh, and, and it's other language-related stuff the rest of the week. And one of the words that I managed to get in was biquinary coded decimal. As I said, unusual words and phrases. Um, I actually know somebody, know of somebody who, said that they took it as a challenge whenever the word came up on a Friday to see if they could drop it into a conversation over the weekend. Hats off to you if you can do that one, OK? Uh, Biquinary coded decimal. A uh, system of representing numbers based on counting in fives. I have no idea where that could have come from, OK? Turns out this is quite popular. Uh, with an additional indicator to show whether the count is in the first or second half of the decimal range, OK? So 0 to 4, 5 to 9, or 1 to 5, 6 to 10. Um, systems found many, uh, you find this in many abacus systems. Uh, I'm talking proper abacus systems, not the abacus systems you give to your kids, but standard abacus systems, they have a, a, a 2, a quinary count, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, OK? So higher or lower. Don't give that to your kids unless you want to mess with them, OK? Give them the ones with 10. Um, but it turns out one of, the, one of the most famous ones is the Roman numeral system. Uh, it's a biquinary coded uh, decimal system. And indeed, biquinary coded decimal systems were used in a number of the early uh, electronic computers, late 40s and early 50s, uh, until somebody sort of said, why are we doing this? Why don't we just use binary? <gasps> Revelation. Everybody was faking decimal. And eventually said, oh, you know what, we're just going to give in. Octal is the way of the future. Yeah. So here we are, 1968. So this is a brilliant excuse to do the Roman numerals carta, which is take an integer and convert it into Roman numerals. We'll just worry about the domain of 1 to 4,000. Um, so uh, I'm going to use a language from, that was conceived of in 1968, although I'm going to use the 1974 version, um, Algol 68. Um, the clue is in the number. Uh, so. Alcohol 68, one of the most influential languages that you've either never heard of or never used. Okay. This is, this is the language where all of these keywords came from. They did not come from C. They came from Algol 68. Algol 68 was responsible for a number of ideas. It, at the time, it was considered to be too ambitious and too large a language. I find it ironic that JavaScript is now larger than Algol 68 was back then. And, and it's not even a language. <laughs> um, it's larger than C. Or rather, C is now larger than it. Originally, C89 was smaller than Algol 68. C11, it's larger. 
It turns out that our idea of size and everything uh, has changed. But it was massively influential in the way that people worked and um, thought about language design. Uh, so yeah, all of these keywords came along from there. So uh, it also had a built-in assert, so I'm going to do some very simple testing here. Assert Romeo's, oh, you can put spaces in the keywords, or spaces in your identifiers. They don't count as significant, it's just the compiler generally ignores them, but it's, it's kind of a, a nice aesthetic. Uh, so the Roman numerals of one is I. Um, oh, you could do string equality and all the rest of it. Those things that people go, oh, you could never do this in the languages of the past. Yes, you could. It's just that the mainstream said, oh, let's ignore that. Let's do Fortran instead. Uh, so here's an implementation. Um, procedure Roman numerals, int, year, turns string. So strings were built in. Um, important thing. All, all expressions could be used as statements, and or everything yielded a value. This is kind of important. There's no return statement here. This is the result of this. This is, in essence, a pure function. Uh, let's go. Assert Roman numerals five is v. Okay. If you've ever wondered where the phi, if if you if you use uh, any uh, Born shell derivative, if elif all that, yeah, this is this. Okay, yeah, so you can see the formatting here. In fact, it turns out Stephen Bourne was heavily influenced by Algol 68. He even wrote the original Bourne shell using C macros to make the C look like Algol 68. It's perverse. These days we call it DSL, but back then it was the it was it was just WTF. You know, it's just like people would open up the file. It says .c on the end. It's just like, what's this? And his, uh, the source code for the original Born Shell was the inspiration for the International Obfuscated C Coding Contest. Um, but if you wonder, this, as I said, very influential. Uh, OK, so we can do all of this, and we can build it up looking like that. Yeah, you're not going to get any prizes for this kind of code. It's very enterprising. Um, OK, let's move forward. Let's actually map stuff. So we're going to create an on-the-fly struct, an array of structures that hold integers and strings. And we're going to have simple mapping. OK, that's going to be a bit easier. And then we're going to run this. And we can see, actually, there's a kind of block structure here. You replace begin and end with um, open and close parentheses. Uh, because back in the late 1960s, the curly bracket was who knows where it was. There was a much more limited vocabulary available on your keyboard as standard. I mean, honestly, if you go to, uh, and, and you know, I still get this when I go to Scandinavia and look at people's keyboards. It's just like, and now a curly bracket. Oh my God, what do I have to do? This is worse than Emacs. You know, it's just like, where is that curly bracket? I need to do this, that, and the other, and then I need to kill a dead chicken. It's just like, okay. Oh, that's always good fun. Yeah. Uh, although I, I remember, there's a job that I used, a uh, job that I was at. We 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 called it ominously the Spanish job. Um, or rather, we had, we had keyboards left over from the Spanish job. And that was great, because in the test room floor, it meant that all the keyboards were Spanish, but with US mapping, and we were in the UK. Basically, the advice was don't look down. Okay. Um, so we've got all of this stuff here. Uh, we can calculate this by running through a lookup table. Uh, I'm going to change the whole approach that we're using for testing. I want a more elegant, table-driven approach for my testing. Um, so let's try this. Uh, propositions, Roman numeral spec, and it turns out that I can create on-the-fly structures and I can initialize everything. I, there's no complexity to the initialization. Decimal positions correspond to numerals. And then I can do, um, there's a, a crazy radical idea here. It's, this is a procedural language. Um, Algol 68 is the epitome of procedural languages. Um, there's a crazy idea. What about having procedures that don't have names? So this is a lambda, basically, if you want it translated. Okay. So uh, this was available to you in late 1960s. So I've, I've got to put all these assertions in. Uh, quinary intervals correspond to numerals. Okay. So I've structured it like that. So we've got a really nice, elegant way of doing the testing. I can create a mode is a rather fancy word for type. It's a mode of access. And then I've got the code to run through that. And I've created myself a nice little testing framework. So uh, that's kind of nice. Um, although, I think I can do better than this. Um, I think we can actually make it properly table-driven, which is quite nice. And at this point, everything starts looking a little bit lisp, uh, which is another language of the 1960s. Um, it's often credited as a language of the 1950s. I did a little bit digging around. First working implementation was not until 1960. So everything before that was just, you know, 
usual kind of like, yeah, we've got this great idea, but have you built it? Not yet. No, it doesn't count. Okay, it doesn't count. First version was 1960. Okay. A um, lot of interesting ideas up until that, but the first working version, about mid-1960, this is my copy of the uh, List 1.5 Programmer's Manual, which was published a couple of years later. I like collecting old books. You can find the PDF of this online. It is really worth a read. It is magnificent as a piece of writing. It actually, because you couldn't guarantee that you were able to target an appropriate machine, it tells you how to build a list machine, basically. It walks you through what you have to do. And it's a really lucid introduction to the ideas. Here's how you build it from the ground up. Uh, and it gets mentioned a number of times in the uh, um, uh, 68 proceedings. OK, so we're going to test this. Let's go back and look at, our, uh, look at our test code, a few other bits and pieces, resizable arrays. Uh, oh, there's a lot of code there. Let's, let's break this one down a little bit. And uh, Is there anything there I want to focus on? Um, yeah, not really. We'll wait till the next bit. OK, we're going to generalize that. Now, right, Roman numerals. Here's the thing. If you look down um, right into the while loop, result plus colon equals, and the next line down, value minus colon equals. Except for the colon, this is the origin of the plus equals and minus equals operator that has made its way through all the C languages. OK, now that, one, uh, that one comes from Algol 68. They didn't have the plus plus thing, but uh, uh, that, that was all in there. Um, so yeah, we've got a quite a nice little uh, test-driven approach. Anything interesting to spot there? No, that's, that's kind of reasonable. And then we have everything. Yes, so everything is now wonderfully 1968-ish. Um, uh, so it turns out you can actually write a fairly modern testing approach. You can f follow this in a very test-driven style. Uh, I'm not going to claim that test-driven development was invented in the 1960s. You had to wait till the 1970s for that. So the 1970s and Unix and Alfred Aho talking about Ork, Aho, Weinberger, and Kernigan. So that's uh, the uh, origins of the name Ork. AWK, standard on every um, Unix and Unix-like installation. A language that has perhaps fallen by the wayside. Uh, used to be very popular, very good at, uh, you know, it was what, a classic one-job language. I do pattern matching well. Um, very elegant in that sense. Uh, in the 1990s, that kind of got displaced, uh, displaced a bit by the line noise that people call Perl. Um, uh, I might be injecting a little of my own opinion into this, you know. Um, but the 21st century sought vengeance with Python and Ruby. Yes. Not, uh, so, yeah, Perl is, uh, Perl is effectively dead. But nonetheless, Orc still has a certain elegance to it. But what I like is reading this interview with Alfred Aho. Uh, we instituted a rigorous regression test for all the features of Orc. Any of the three of us who put in a new feature into the language first had to write a test for the new feature. So this is like, this is test first programming 1970s style. Um, it's one of the ways you can guarantee you have enough coverage, but also make sure that you have not missed anything. In other words, if you're always overstepping, if you're always saying, we will have 110% coverage, yeah, so this is very football manager, 110% coverage, um, then you, in other words, you've covered more than you actually have code for, and therefore you fulfill that commitment. But they still had some pretty good ideas about testing. Alan Perlis observed, there is no such question as testing things after the fact with simulation models, but that in effect the testing and the replacement of simulations with modules that are deeper and more detailed goes on with the simulation model controlling, as it were, the place and order in which things are done. Now, this is not obvious. It's not obvious what he's saying here. Um, and it was Glenn Vandenberg who gave me the insight on this one. He's talking about mocks. He's talking about mock objects. Um, he's describing... Uh, there's a discussion in here about uh, a paper from Brian Randall about an approach to testing. And it, we would now recognize as a mock object approach. Uh, mock objects were formally invented um, around Archway Station in North London in 1999. Uh, but clearly, there was, uh, there was a sort of a, a Jurassic version here. As design work progresses, this simulation will gradually evolve into the real system. The simulation is the design. Really interesting thought. Now, it's also one of those eras when people associate very strongly with structured programming. Structured programming, the phrase had been around in the late 60s. This book was not published till 71, 72. Uh, but it contains um, papers and writing that date back to 68 uh, from Uli Johandal, Esker Dijkstra, and Tony Hoare. 
And there's some really good insights in here. Uh, one of the most powerful mechanisms for program structuring is the block and procedure concept. Let's go back to an earlier version. So there you go, block and, there's your block concept, begin, end. Um, and here, we're basing this on an earlier version of, um, an earlier derivative of ALGOL 60. You see, with ALGOL 60, they used full words like integer. But when they hit ALGOL 68, it's just like, yeah, we don't need those extra noise, noisy words, okay? They had words like character. Ah, char, you know, this is it. So it was, a, it was a time of minimalism, if you like. But uh, so we've got all kinds of stuff here. OK, so we can put procedures inside blocks. This is a really interesting thing. The proper block structured allow language allows you to put procedures inside blocks. So it's a very, it's a recursive idea. It's a very natural tree structure. But the next bit's really interesting. A procedure which is capable of giving rise to block instances which survive its call will be known as a class and the instances will be known as objects of that class. So uh, let's just get this straight. The idea is that a, a standard block comes into existence when the thread of execution enters it. The variables that are associated with it come into existence, the state associated with that block, the procedures, the behavior associated with that block come into existence, and then they all pop out of existence when you return from that. Well, that's interesting. What if you didn't return from it? Or rather, what if you could have the block, its state and its behavior, together outlive that basic execution? Then you've got yourself an object. And you can take the code I've just put in there, and you suddenly you've got a class. So this is Simula 67. And that was the origin of the object model. Was Lots of people have various different theories about it, but actually it's very well documented that this is the idea. You take a, you take a block, and you're allowed to name it and come back to it and say, hey, you had state that I found useful. Okay, um, Simeon 67, along with ALGOL 68, had garbage collection, just as a point of reference. So, to be fair though, when people think structured programming, they normally think about the go-to, the battle of the go-to. We ended up forgetting about all the other structure, because that's at the back of the book. Yeah, the front of the book is all about control flow, and then there's stuff on data and data abstraction. And, then, and it's just like, oh, people I forget that. So it turns out that when they said structured programming, they meant structured, not just control flow. The problem is that when you, when you transmit a message, when you want to get an idea out to more people, what eventually happens is you end up with a simplified version of it, and it gets diluted. We've seen this with pretty much every craze that we've ever had. It doesn't matter if it's components or objects or agile. We're seeing it now with functional. You know, it's just like, oh yeah, if you do this project in functional, yeah, we're using pragmatic functional. Just as clarification, often the word pragmatic in front of something means not. If, you've, if you haven't worked that one out, yeah? We're doing pragmatic TDD. We're not doing TDD. We're doing pragmatic agile. We're not doing agile. We're doing pragmatic functional. We're not doing functional programming. Oh, yeah, we've got functions. Yes, but they've got their own gravitational field. They're so large. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we've got pragmatic side effects. And, yeah, we call that procedural programming. So I lived through the Fortran era, and this was a plague upon all houses. There was a reason that people hated this thing. Uh, and 1968, Edsger Dijkstra, go-to statement considered harmful. This was the point of origin for this phrase in software development. In fact, there's even another word for it, okay? This is a snow clone. A snow clone is basically a, a parameterized phrase. Cliched wording, um, used as a template, typically originating in a single quote. You know them when you see them. X considered harmful. These aren't the X's you're looking for. X is the new Y. It's X plus none as we know it. No X left behind. It's X's all the way down. All your X are belong to us. And so on. OK? So X considered harmful. Go to statement considered harmful. You know what? Dijkstra didn't write that. That's not what he wrote. This is what he wrote. He was meticulous in keeping a document of everything that he wrote and sent off. A case against the go-to statement, which is much more modest. Go-to statement considered harmful is 1960s clickbait. <laughs> OK? You won't believe what happened to this enterprise code base when I added a go-to. <gasps> I must look at this, yeah? This was actually, um, this was actually Nicholas Wirth, who was the editor 
Communications of the ACM at this point who changed the title. Nicholas Worth, best known for uh, being the inventor of Pascal. And as an, a side note, I've got the original, I've got one of the, uh, well, the original third edition, uh, Pascal um, language report, in which, interestingly enough, there is a version of Roman numerals that is absolutely terrible. And it's nowhere near as elegant as the Algol 68 version I put together. No, it's not just because I put it together. It's because Pascal's not a proper language. Um, right. So, separation of tasks is a good thing. On the other hand, we have to tie the loose ends together again. That's what Dijkstra observed. So, it's time to go back to Doug McElroy. Okay, I'm cheating a bit. This is not 1968, this is 1964. Um, Doug McElroy had this vision of how programs should scale and this idea of what we would now call a coordination language. Um, and how to deal with concurrency. We should have some ways of coupling programs like garden hose, screw in another segment when it becomes necessary to massage data in another way. And this is the way of I.O. also. This is the pipeline. This is the Unix pipeline. Um, it took them six years to find the pipe symbol on the keyboard. I said it was, a, it was a time of great difficulty when it came to the keyboard. Six years. It's just like, well, which, which symbol should we use? And that was actually Ken Thompson who said, right, enough of this. We're going to do this way. But the whole concept of the pipeline architecture as a way of organizing procedural code um, has very, very, uh, very old origins. So in wrapping this up, everything has been said before. But since nobody listens, we must always start again. So this is the point. We have a history in software development. And at this point, I'm not saying that we had everything worked out. We absolutely did not. But when we look back and say, when we credit certain things as being new ideas, that's a very different statement. It turns out that many of the ideas um, that we now think of as relatively normal, or in some cases, in some uh, circles and in some languages, oh, this is a relatively new idea. And people are still struggling with the idea of iterative development, all these kinds of things. The industry is like molasses. And the front and the back are, oh, so far apart sometimes. But it's really interesting to note that these were ideas that had currency back then. And we still treat them as relatively novel currency now. What that means in practice is that um, these ideas have taken some time to mature. Some of it, as I said, money. Some of it's hardware. But it also means that not everything that we looked at back then and rejected, some of it was terrible. Some of it's good, and we still haven't explored it. But it also means that the stuff we have around us now that we're not paying attention to is probably the stuff that somebody in 50 years' time will be doing a presentation on. Thank you very much. <laughs>